So I always like to begin with um, the end in mind. So for the next 30 minutes, what success would be for me is you can think about the story of two completely different worlds and what it might be like to uh, be the CMO under very different circumstances. So we'll start with the world of Cruz, who has been on a cruise before. You live in Miami, it's very little excuse um, not to be. Um, and a brand that has very, very high awareness, but significant barriers to trial when you think about bringing people into the cruise industry. And in a completely other kind of case where you're talking about the brand that really is born of social and really grew really, really fast, but without the power of paid media and what to do in that kind of situation. So just with the beginning of end in mind, who here aspires to be CMO one day? Who has that ambition? Yep. Well, it's good that you actually know what you want. And if you asked me a couple years ago and you say about becoming CMO, CMO and what that path would be like, I would tell you I didn't realize that this, the different steps that I was on would actually lead to this place. And so for me, it's always interesting about how do you learn something in every situation and never knowing that, that what you were learning at that point was really broadening your skill set um, to come to a point where you have the wide ranging skills um, to take it to the next level, in this case being very fortunate to be the steward of two brands. So we'll start with Carnival Cruise Line. And I would assume a lot of you are familiar with the brand. Who is familiar with uh, what was once known as the Poop Cruise? Anyone? Okay, so if you lived in Miami, you might have been knowing about a ship that might have gotten stuck in the middle of the ocean when there was a little bit of an incident and the ship lost power, couldn't really return safe to port. And at that point, that is what you see on the graph here where that bottom line is the brand index of Carnival Cruise Line. The blue and the green are of um, the closest competitors, Royal and Norwegian. So you imagine a brand that went through a significant brand incident, really getting their brand index down and then really trying to get back up. Um, but even broader than that, when we think about cruising when I was in Carnival, it wasn't that cruise lines were the other competitor. We really thought of other land-based options like hotels as really the competitor. And with Carnival, in the broader portfolio of Carnival Corporation, it was really the tip of the spear. 70% of the database that was actually in Carnival Cruise Line, Carnival Corporation came from Carnival Cruise Line. That means the new to cruise actually started with the Carnival brand. So the mandate of the Carnival Cruise brand was really to bring new to cruise in. But when you think about cruise, there were a lot of barriers to trial. And so given the barriers to trial, and I'll give you um, my favorite example to just illustrate what I mean by barriers to trial. I was talking to another CMO at another summit and I said, you know, what is interesting about Carnival is I feel like we have the challenge of having Orlando and Las Vegas at sea. So you have the families who are taking a family vacation, feels like it's Orlando, and then you have the people who feel like they're on spring break, it feels a little bit like Las Vegas, the world that I was formerly in, and then they come together on this ship for a three to seven day vacation. And this very insightful CMO said, no, your challenge is actually worse. It's actually Orlando meets Las Vegas on Alcatraz. <laughs> That's not how we talk to customers, of course, but if you think about what that mental barrier is, the people who have barriers to trial think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be stuck on a ship. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get seasick. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna get sick. All of those barriers to trial. And with cruising, when you think about driving trial, for those of you who have bottled water in your table, if you wanted to try a new bottled water product, somebody would just give you a sample, risk-free, and say, hey, try this, and then you know, okay, I like this or not. But with cruising, it's a little bit harder because I cannot give you a sample. I can just say, here, try this risk-free. And also, when you think about vacations, these are things that you save up for over a long period of time. And if you're the decision maker and planner in the family, everybody is looking forward to this. Are you going to really take a risk on something that you're not completely sure about? So a little bit of brand baggage, a little bit of barriers to trial given some biases against crews, a little bit hard to potentially drive trial to get over that bear to trial. So when I came into this thinking about this, I thought, you know, I always like to have frameworks in terms of how can I make sure I'm thinking about something in a messy way, mutually exclusive, completely exhaustive. So one of the frameworks that I found, uh, Beg Bard steal from a book, is the seven part framework. Doesn't mean that it's sequential, but it's just a nice way to say, have I thought through everything? So I'll go through this quickly. I won't go through it here, but I'll give you some examples. So first, interrupt the pattern. Part of the marketing you'll always hear is that you don't want to be just really coming at somebody and saying, here, I'm a cruise. Um, the way I explain it um, to my team was, it's like going to a bar saying, hi, how are you? Will you marry me? Doesn't work in real life. It probably doesn't work with cruising and marketing, right? So you don't want to come across right away really hard selling. And the question is, how could you interrupt the pattern? 
So a couple of examples we had here using moments of culture. So we said, if you're familiar with Pangsitani Phil, where you guess where who guesses how long winter will be, we said we're going to own the day of summer, and Bill the sloth, and sloth was trending at the time, um, is going to predict how long summer is going to be. So things that are not exactly cruise related, but somehow you're able to enter the, the consciousness and the dialogue either through something entertaining or something informative. Other times we use other people to make that introduction. It's almost like being at the bar and then you have somebody that's introducing you to the friend and all of a sudden that friend kind of is open to having a discussion with you. We have somebody else making that introduction. So in this case, we were working with BuzzFeed with them and their branded content using their storytelling and their distribution in terms of their insights to be able to then tell the story about cruising. And because you're seeing it from somebody else, it's a little bit more trustworthy before hearing it from the brand. Creating comfort. If you're familiar with Hyundai and the um, warranty of assurance back when there was a recession, they said, buy a car. If you lose a job, you can return the car. And so coming from that issue that we had and people have a risk uh, perception, the question is, how do you create that content? All the time when you watch something on late night TV and they say, try this risk free, how do we create that notion? Because you can't return the cruise. Um, and so we created this um, great vacation guarantee that if you actually don't like the cruise on that first day, we'll actually send you back home, give you 110% of the cruise value and pay for your return trip. And I'll promise you nobody, it sounds like a big deal, but the number of people who are actually taking us up on that once they're on the cruise is actually very small because you're already in that vacation mode. Um, I remember there was a family and the parents were not too happy and they were trying to arrange um, to this great vacation guarantee, but the son and the kids were just so unhappy about leaving and they decided to stay because you're already in that cruise mindset. And then we have change associations. So we, we like to think about building our brand on other people's brands and just changing the association. So if you've associated us with maybe that poop cruise, how do we just change the association? And so we thought about leveraging celebrities, leveraging passion points, uh, leveraging charity, leveraging experiences, and use these other brands by which to tell our story. What's interesting here, especially in an experiential product like cruising, they're a part not only of the storytelling, but you can also infuse them into the actual product that you're offering. So if I'll give you an example with Guy Fieri, not only is he a spokesperson for the brand, but we actually have the Guy Fieri experience with the burgers on board. So both in the uh, storytelling and the communications, but also infusing it into the product. And then when you do that, you also have them tell that story for you. So we did a partnership with Ellen, we did a partnership with all these other brands, but then having them tell it through their channels. Um, because with that, you get the fans of them, so you have not only the association and the content, but also the distribution. And what I found when people work with, the, with celebrities, Sometimes the celebrities are quite expensive, but if you don't have enough money put into the distribution, then you really don't get the bang for the buck. And so a lot of times when we look at these kinds of evaluation, we wanna make sure that we have as much in the distribution uh, versus just in the celebrity endorser that you have to pay for. Um, in a past life when working with much more money, we did have a celebrity that we paid almost in the seven million range and the distribution was a million dollars. Obviously that's a little bit not balanced, so you always want to make sure you're focusing on how you can actually get that word out as well. Um, and sometimes we try to also tie this with passion points, as I mentioned earlier. For example, one with Thank You Burger, we actually took, um, this part I was very excited from a digital standpoint, how do we actually engage the people who are passionate about our brand, but also passionate about things or shared values that we care for? So Carnival actually sails the most number of military members um, on, on the cruise ships. We actually worked um, with the military where it was July 4th. You could actually tweet or send through social a message um, to the military to thank them. We actually took those manage messages off of Twitter and then we actually laser inscribed them to the actual bun of the Guy Fieri burger. So if you see that burger with white text on it. I don't know if you can see it that well. That's actually an actual message from our fans that they actually want to send um, to the military member with their hashtag. And then we took a photo of that military person with the burger, 
with the message and then sent that photo back to the person that actually sent us that message. Um, and to be able to do that, what was also interesting to us when we were watching this behavior, the actual people, um, military people who were actually getting this burger on July 4th um, in the military base in San Diego, they saw the hashtag uh, from the person who gave them the message. They were actually contacting them and direct messaging them directly on their social channels. So really closing that loop in terms of how do you get people who are passionate about something engaging with the brand in a kind of va shared value in a moment of culture that we could really own. Um, just as an aside, to be able to laser inscribe um, the message to the burger in a high production way, we actually had to take a machine that was used for um, laser engraving silver and turn down the heat power to actually not burn the bun. So you can imagine the kind of experimentation that was going on um, as we were trying to do this. We were even trying, we were this close um, to actually doing this um, in the Middle East on an aircraft carrier and we couldn't get the laser inscribed machine through customs in time. Um, so always, what I guess what I'm just trying to tell you is different ways of trying to tell that story, but also engaging the community, but through digital platforms that create those connections and then the, there's a self-perpetuating notion of closing that loop. Many other partners, uh, what was interesting about Carnival Cruise Line, because we say we are America's cruise line, we want to be able to talk to all different kinds of segments. And so different partners, whether they were family related, whether they were sports fans, whether they were moms with Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, my favorite one was really working with Amazon. As you can imagine, while Carnival is big, Amazon is the really big one. Um, sitting across the table from them and saying, okay, how can we have a partnership? Uh, where we do something in two to four weeks. You know, my experience with partnership, it's always, you have the meeting, it sounds good on both sides, you talk and you talk, but then no action gets done. And we said, this is all about momentum. How do we get something done in two to four weeks? Um, and from the time that we actually talked with them at a lunch in New York to the time that we actually launched, this was actually three weeks. Um, and when I was talking to the Amazon folks, like you guys talk, got our attention because it took effort on both sides to go through all the barriers to execute something that was completely new to both sides um, and escalating and holding hands all the way through. But it is really about saying, okay, we're gonna do this. We have the organizational will to do this and we're gonna go through each barrier together. Um, and we're gonna do this in a short amount of time so we can actually get momentum and a quick win until we do something bigger. And to actually have, at least in my opinion, on the Amazon website, the Carnival brand logo and the Amazon brand logo together was a big win without having to pay them money. Lead the imagination. So as I mentioned earlier, it's very hard to sample. And so we tried different kinds of digital technologies to try to have the cruise experience come to life as much as possible um, so that you can really sample what that might be and really romance the idea of cruising so that you can lead, you know, to use that term, lead the imagination. So whether that was 360 videos, um, what I'll call the top one is first person fly throughs. So you're using the camera as if you're the person that's walking through it. It's almost like having a GoPro um, on yourself. Doing that both in horizontal format and then Snapchat um, was early at the time. To the one in the bottom where um, we really tried to recreate the cruise from a five senses standpoint in a dome. So when you go in, the entire surroundings is, looks like you're on a cruise and we try to also include the sights and the sounds because for something that's so experiential that requires the senses, digital can only go so far in tapping to all five senses. So sometimes even in the physical space while at low um, throughput can also help bring something um, to life. But every time we did do something that was in the offline space, we also always tried to make sure that we had something in the online space to broaden that distribution. So shifting the feeling, and I'll end on this one and then I'll move um, to BoxyCharm. One of the things that was key was the decision as to when do you change the agency or not. Um, what, some CMOs do an RFP of their agency's creative and media right when they start. Um, the agency that we had 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 been working with Carnival for the last eight years. Um, being new to the brand, I said, you know what, we're gonna learn first from the agency and really see if we can take this to the next level. After that first year, determined that was not the case, did an RFP, and we said, okay, we really need to think about this differently. How do we address the trials, um, trial barriers? How do we inspire and connect with people who have not tried cruising? 
and how do we elevate the game when what's happening in cruise, if you, all of you see the advertising, it's all about who has the bigger, better ship. Um, and really do that when I think about Carnival versus Royal with one third of the media budget of the competition. So what I used to tell my team is our marketing has to work three times harder to just be at par when Royal outspends us three to one. And so we thought about what would be a gold standard for what makes sense of a new brand campaign, knowing that the last one was a brand campaign that we had for the last eight years. And what we thought about it is that the barriers to trial that we had really came down to identity. You did not think of yourself as a cruiser. It wasn't just about, will I get sick? Am I gonna get seasick? Am I gonna be stuck on the ship? Am I gonna have enough time on board? It really was a matter of identity. Do I see myself as a cruiser? Am I gonna be ashamed to tell people, oh, I went to a cruise? And if the issue is identity, that it is much more rooted, how do you get past that barrier to trial? And so when you think about identity, we said, well, whatever it is that we say has to be a shared brand value that we can connect on, that then you can identify with so that we can get over that barrier. And when I think about shared brand values, I said, well, if we're gonna have a new brand statement, it should be like a bumper sticker. So if you go back to political campaigns, and we were doing this, it was right after the presidential election, I said, my gold standard for a new brand campaign where it is founded on identity is something that could fit on a bumper sticker. Because if you believe in it, you're willing to actually put it on your car and say, I believe that. And so the brilliant agency that we ended up picking actually changed our campaign to the notion of choose fun. And we said that if you are somebody that chooses fun, even when there is a storm, even when there's traffic, you actually can choose how to have fun, and that is actually the personality of a Carnival Cruiser. And that's the kind of person we have shared brand values with, and that's the persona of the brand, and everything that then could be wrapped around that. So we had our chief fun officer uh, that we announced as our CFO, um, Shaq. We um, had him you know, do the tour on the ship. Um, we had one of the things that we were able to do is we had him do one-liners against a green screen. So we actually produce content from one day that we can actually use the entire year. And then one of the other things that we did um, was actually think about mnemonics. So when you think about branding, at least in my limited opinion, there, if you go to the book, um, How Brands Grow, it talks about distinction, distinctiveness versus differentiation. It's not just about, hey, do I do my SWOT analysis? What am I really good at? What are my different devices so that I am mentally available to you as a brand? Um, when I was being interviewed by the CEO of Carnival and I asked him what's the definition of good marketing, he said it was the movie Focus, if you know this movie with Will Smith. Um, so in the movie Focus, you needed, he needed to con somebody, I'm gonna read it for all of you who haven't watched the movie. Um, you had to say the number 55 to, win the, to make the con. And so what I mean by that is you're gonna think about a vacation you want Carnival Cruise Line to be the most mentally available brand that comes up in your head subconsciously. And that comes from distinctive elements that you own that you repeat with the amount of frequency. And so he said, well, okay, we need a new device. It cannot just be the funnel, which is what is on top of the ship that's red, white, and blue. We said, let's take that funnel and let's imbue meaning into it. And so if you take that Y shape of the funnel, what the agency realized is that it actually is very similar to the power pose of the, of, um, the letter Y. And when you do that feeling, and I don't know if you guys wanna just try that right now, there's a TED talk that actually says you actually feel more open and powerful. <laughs> Same feeling that you have, but why, why do people raise their hand as they're crossing the line in the Olympics? You feel it? You feel it with me? And so he said, why don't we imbue that meaning into the funnel? Because that's the same feeling of being open and having fun, of crossing that finish line, and now we've imbued something into our mnemonic. And the other thing that we did is we said, we're going to now try to really get data about customers and then imbue that into personalized video marketing. So we had six second vignettes that talked about every possible thing on a Carnival cruise. And then what we were working to do is that your specific 30 second ad would be a combination of five different six second ads that were based on what we knew about you so that somebody else's 30 second ad could actually be different based on the signals that we had about them. So the ultimate in personalized marketing, not only in the digital banner space, but even in digital video space. All by having modularized content that is based on data. So, Really a story around large brand, 
barriers to trial, how do we leverage the framework, especially in the context of really trying to leverage what we had in terms of resources when we're co competing against somebody that has three times um, you know, the resources. So switching to a completely different story. So while we're waiting for the boxy term for a slide, how many know the brand? Oh, good, I'm so happy right now. You've made my day, okay. Can we start with the video for those who don't know it? Brand, you're going to consider working with BoxyCharm because BoxyCharm will definitely get your products out there in the hands of highly engaged consumers. A $21 subscriber is not a $10 subscriber. They have a different buying power. Their, their consideration is different than everyone else. At the same time, we make sure that you get the right products in the box, not anything you have on hand just because we're getting it for free. We're paying you the manufacturing cost. It costs you absolutely nothing. And then, you're going to be taking a piece of those one billion mentions every month on social media. You're going to be part of that. Because mega influencers, mid-sized influencers, art charmers, they're all going to talk about that. We'll create momentum for your brand. I got my boxy charm. Boxy charm, box. Boxy charm. Boxy charm. Hey, boxy charm. 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 My boxy charm. I'm boxing. This is what we're going after. We're going to help you grow your social media followers. Doesn't matter how big you are, but when we do a campaign, you're going to grow with influencers. No matter who you are, you will see the needle moving. And all that costs you nothing. The consideration is, do you want your product to be there? or someone else's product. He's great. So um, what is BoxyCharm for those who don't know? So it is a monthly subscription box. You pay $21 a month um, for the box that you see on top, $49 uh, a quarter for the box that you get quarterly in the bottom, and you get five times what you pay. So for the $21 box, you get $100 worth of beauty product. For the $49 box, you get actually $250 of product. Um, so it's a great value for the customer who wants to be able to try something different every month. And then for the brands, we actually are a marketing partner for them. So they are able to drive full-size sampling of their product, and we're able to actually get them new social followers, we're able to trend them on social where they see higher um, search volume for their brands. So we have those two different customers in our mind. And so when you think about the BoxyCharm story, it has really been a company based in Miami, um, in Pembroke Pines, that actually has been growing pretty fast, to the point it actually was the number 176 fastest growing company nationwide um, in 2018. And what was amazing to me when I first learned about the brand is that if this is the number of subscribers um, from the time that it started, paid media started only at that point where you see that arrow. And so that means that the brand really grew and born of social with the community, with the social influencers, was what was fueling that growth up until the time that the paid media started. So really a brand born of social and of a community. And when you think about it, you might be familiar with Birchbox, Dollar Shave Club, Ipsy. So Birchbox, is, this is the YouTube search trend um, volume that's indexed over the last five years. And the red line um, is Birchbox, the yellow line is Dollar Shave Club, the green line is Ipsy, and the blue line is BoxyCharm. So when you think about YouTube search volume over the last five years index, you can tell the trend of which brand is the most searched um, on YouTube. And it's probably the brand some of you didn't realize would be the one. Um, and then from an engagement standpoint, just to use a objective third party to measure it, if, if people were following the best nine on Instagram last year, and you tried to find, well, how many um, posts did you do? How much engagement did you like? So just use this third party tool um, BoxyCharm on the left, Ipsy on the right, we had double the number of likes per post, 14,000 on average, than Ipsy had. So a highly, highly engaged um, set of followers with the content that we're posting. And then when we work with brands, for example, Pharmacy or Biogeo, um, Tribe Dynamics is a tool that actually measures earned media value every month, and they do a report. 
in terms of what are the brands in beauty and hair care, skin care, that actually generated the most uh, earned media value each month. And for the last six months, three of the brands that we've featured, um, four actually of the brands that we've featured, actually broke into the top 10. And then when you read the report from Tribe Dynamics, the reason that they broke into the top 10 is because they were featured in the BoxyCharm box. And no other subscription box is actually in that report. And then when you look below, um, that is the YouTube search um, index for the brands over the last 12 months. Indexed to 100, that means that's the highest volume. Um, the month that they were in the box is the month that they had the highest search volume on YouTube um, over a 12 month period. So we were able to trend the brand from an earned media value standpoint. We're able to then get customers to then search for that brand. And then when you talk to brands like the CEO of Luxie Brushes, they actually see a lift in retail. Um, Tatcha, that was the brand that was in January's box, actually doubled its sales so much so that it actually sold out in Sephora. They didn't have enough supply. So how does that happen? So we think about the flywheel. And so when I encourage you to think about strategies, I was fortunate enough to um, be in a session with Jim Collins, um, who wrote Good to the Great, if you're familiar with that book. And he talks about this notion of a flywheel. And what's interesting about the concept of a flywheel is it has to be self-perpetuating, meaning what's one leg of that flywheel really has to lead into the next and really lead into the next. And we did exercises for, okay, what is a flywheel for Amazon? What's a flywheel for Netflix? Um, and I'm on, a company, I'm on the board of another company, and we did that exercise for them, too. So when I step back and I think, well, what is the flywheel for BoxyCharm? I think about it two ways. One is that we have amazing brands. Those are a sample of the brands that we featured in the box recently. And because we have amazing brands, the influencers therefore want to work with us because they want to work with trendy brands. And then we have influencers that work with us. Then the charmers, who what we call our subscribers, therefore subscribe. And then when we have charmers, more brands want to work for us. So that self-perpetuating flywheel that allows the company to grow. Behind that, from a marketing standpoint, we did work on that cool factor, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then from that cool factor, really engaging that community. And because we have that cool factor, an engaged community that has a high level of engagement, we therefore are able to have work um, with the social algorithms where we're able to get higher reach, which then feeds that cool factor. So if I go into two of those pieces, in terms of cool factor, I've worked with celebrities, worked with influencers, insert ourselves in the culture, whether that's music videos on top, um, we were featured in the actual music video. Uh, most recently, Coachella had 15 influencers um, attend with us, um, working with the press when we were doing it with Cyber and Holiday. All these different things, big, small, to really just make sure that we're always in and of culture and that people will want to then, therefore, um, work with us. From a community standpoint, and I'll play the video in a second, a lot of the community actually creates content on their own and shares that with us. They actually even self-organize. We have forums that we don't administer that have about 50,000 members each. And they just talk amongst themselves um, about the products, about life, about beauty. And the fact that they're able to do that uh, with very little intervention from us just shows how powerful and connected that community is. And with, the, with those two things, they actually engage with us and with brands. So to give you just, an, uh, just to end this now and give you an example about how we really engage the community, and the community is so much um, creating content for us, for a brand that is really authentic, meaning it doesn't look very polished. Um, it really tries to keep it real. I'll give you an example of what that kind of content looks like, but I'll pause it midway so it's not too long. What's up, everybody? So today we're going to be opening up this BoxyCharm box that, you know, I pay for every month. It gets more and more expensive. One month it's 20, and the next month it's 50. And my wife says, oh my gosh, something great's coming in the mail. We're gonna go ahead and do a live reaction video of what's going on inside this BoxyCharm box. Let's see what they have in store for us. Okay. Here's a knife. Oh my God, I just cannot wait to freaking open this. Hello. Oh my freaking gosh, a bag, <laughs> a bag. So everybody, look, it's iconic. We have iconic London. 
um, eyebrow cushion. This, normally, $95. I got it for $50. All this for $50. This is normally $95. Can you believe that? Lily Lashes. Looks like they just came off a dead body. Lily Lashes. Oh, so nice. Becca. Becca lipstick. Not Rebecca. Becca lipstick. <laughs> Normally, $216. Got it all in this box for $50. Oh my gosh. Confidence in a cream. You can't buy confidence. But you can buy it in a cream. We can pause it there. We love George. That video, as you can probably tell, we did not script at all. He did that completely on his own. It got 3.3 million views. So when you have a community very much passionate, very much engaged, this notion of content that keeps it real, that engenders trust and authenticity, you're really able to connect with the consumer and trend brands. Thank you very much. So I tried to get through material. Hopefully I was able to give you a tale of both worlds. So questions? Hi. Hello. Um, how does the brand BoxyCharm go about like, getting new products? Or how do you guys do that selection process? So we um, do have a buying sourcing team that is assigned to really build relationships with brands. We have a pitch document that tells them the story about how we can build the brand with them. So in the beginning, as you can imagine, it was an um, effort to get brands to try um, working with us. But then once they started working with us and seeing results, they, were, they, came, they keep coming back. And then their sister brands, because they're usually part of a larger portfolio, also come in. And then when their competitors see that they're trending, um, because of us, then they also want in. So give you an example, we had Too Faced Mascara in February's box. After that great success, um, Benefit Cosmetics is calling us, not us calling them. Um, Briojo is a hair product that we trended on that EMV report that you saw. Um, after that, um, that was in January, we have Kedastas um, calling us and we just met them in New York. So success breeds success when it actually works. So if you're a smaller brand, you don't necessarily have access to the kind of influencers that we do. So because we're able to scale um, the benefit of what we have from a marketing standpoint, they really see that growth from a social followers and influencer standpoint. So when Luxie brand first started, they were able to grow 50,000 social followers in a month that they worked with us. So if you're a small brand that can't scale that fast, you really see the benefit of something that you probably can't afford on your own. Hi. 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 Um, my name is Carmen. Uh, I kind of wanted to pick at your brain a little bit. I actually worked for Costa Cruise Lines. Okay. So the sister brand. Yeah. And our whole thing is how to bring branding here to America since we're so developed in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then of course here having such a smaller budget compared to our sisters here in America. Trying to work and create our brand here and kind of not necessarily rebrand but put ourselves out there and say who we are. Yeah, so very familiar with Costa. Um, my, honey, my honeymoon was actually on a Costa cruise, worked with a Costa team um, that's based in Europe. In, in my mind, I think one is romancing the notion of cruise and then romancing the notion of the Italian piece of the cruise. So the way I would think about it from a life cycle standpoint, it's probably not somebody that is first to cruise but probably somebody who has already done the cruise and now, okay, I checked off the box with Caribbean, I've checked off the box with Alaska, now I wanna have my Italian experience and probably, so it's in, probably more of the life cycle of where they are in a cruise and how do you really own that? Do you have a great spokesperson in Shakira, if I remember it correctly? Uh, right now it's Penelope. But at one point, but, so there's a familiar face already that could be associated with the brand just to introduce that and just notion of Italian living, which is very much associated with having fun. Um, when I was at Venetian and Palazzo back when I worked in Las Vegas, we talked about how is their Venetian, which is the Italian lifestyle, versus Parisian, which is the Parisian lifestyle. And we went through an exercise that said, if an Italian woman walked into the room versus a Parisian woman walked into the room, what does that brand feel like? 
and it's very different. What does abundance feel like if you're Italian? What does abundance feel like when you're Parisian? Um, from a standpoint that you could really own the brand and having a very clear definition of that Italian lifestyle and bringing that to life for somebody that's more mature probably in their next, um, in a cruise lifestyle standpoint. But if I had the answers, I probably would have helped already when I was there. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today sure. and for the insightful presentation. Um, I'm Alison Sokolsky. I'm from Cohort 7. And <laughs> my question is, I understand that you get most of your revenue through monthly subscriptions, but is there another source of revenue? And also, when you partner up with companies, do they also provide a fee for you to sponsor their products? So um, there is margin in um, the box. So I know it's kind of hard to imagine how can we sell something $21 that's worth 100 and still make money, but I promise you we make money on the $21 box. Um, we do have upgrade options, so the $49 is an upgrade. Um, we have limited edition boxes that you can also buy. So the way we think about it is the $21 box is like your Amazon Prime subscription or your Costco membership. And then after you pay that base level entry, you're opened up to a series of benefits um, that for us is also additional revenue. <laughs> And then there are brands, with the brands right now, there's a base level of marketing that they get just by being the box. And then we have what we call boosted marketing where they can pay for additional marketing. So for example, when we did Coachella, we worked with Pure, Luxie, Dr. Brand. They paid additional dollars to be co-activated with us, with the influencers at Coachella. So there's another revenue stream from a boosted marketing standpoint. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Marlene. I'm from Cohort 4. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I used to work for Carnival and Norwegian, so I totally understand you on the barriers of cruising, but um, it's shameful for me to say that I am addicted to subscription boxes. That's good. So how do you stay ahead of the curve against your competitors like Ipsy and FabFitFun and all of these other ones that I'm um, a member of to introduce new products and continue keeping um, customers loyal and also um, experiencing um, new product. Sure. I, when we think about the four pillars, we really believe product is king. Like, you've always heard content is king, whether you're in the media world or not. So the, the brands do still have to always be good. We go through a very, um, somebody asked about curation earlier, we go through a very intense curation process where there are more brands actually that want to be in the box than we actually put in the box. Um, and we go through a curation process that says what's good enough to be in the box, what is universal enough, or what goes against this segment versus that segment, because that will drive satisfaction. And then we really do look at the brand influencer charmer experience, because the better that experience, the better they'll keep coming back. And we also keep the brand very real. So when something doesn't go completely right, we're right there right away um, talking about that. And we do so with a company, uh, with a face of the company. So the people who are actually team members in the company, whether that's Joe, who's our CEO, the people that are on the social team that report to me, they're actually front facing to the camera. So what's amazing to me, having gone from big company to small, the social team actually is the talent that faces the camera. They're the ones that edit the actual video and they actually the ones that are, write the copy and then actually post it. And then they're actually looking at the analytics, full end to end working on that social. But what that also does from a, um, charmer standpoint is it keeps a company very real and transparent to the point that really engenders trust. So when something goes wrong and we're very transparent about it, that relationship still stays very solid. Because I find um, brand fatigue after a while, like for instance, first box is like, okay, uh, again, dry shampoo, how many more dry shampoos can I get? Sure. So again. Yeah, and I think what the way that I'm thinking about it, and I like alliterations, you know, three C's, there's this notion of curation. So if you think about a museum, there's one museum for everybody. So if you're a good curator, you're able to put something that's trending from an art standpoint, but it's kind of universal for everybody that buys the ticket. Then there's customization. So I get better data about you, a la, a la Stitch Fix. Based on that, I know what to put in a box. And then there's choice. You choose what you actually put in a box. So the, the spectrum around curation, customization, choice is where the different brands need to play and how do you then design products and services that have the right amount of that or tailor it to the right person. I'll tell you, it's, it's interesting to me how people actually find the box. You would think people want more choice or control, um, but there's actually a huge segment that actually just likes the notion of discovery. Don't tell me what's in the box. Don't make me choose, surprise me. We were doing a focus group and we were showing the November box ahead of it being shipped and one of the women 
who actually wait for her daughter to get the box so that they can actually go and FaceTime and open it at the same time. Refused, like really look, turned away, don't show me the box, you're gonna ruin it for me. And so that notion, it's not just the product that is in the box, it's that actual experience of anticipating a box. People are guessing what's going to be in the box. They're posting, oh my box, it weighs 0.01. They'll put the weight from the FedEx slip all the way to the second uh, decimal on the social post and said, this was in my box, this was the weight. And then people are like, oh my box has that weight, I must be getting that variation. They're guessing what's in the box. When Joe does a video and then he puts a product in front and says, the Too Faced mascara is gonna be February box, he steps away from camera, there's some mascara in behind the table, says nothing about it, all of social goes, oh my gosh, is that the Morphe palette, is that 15N, do you think it's the next month's box? That notion of discovery, of shared anticipation, is part of what you're actually buying. It's not just the product and getting five times value. Yeah. Hi, Andy, so uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I work in digital marketing in the travel industry, so my two questions are more related to your experience at Carnival. So the first thing that you were talking about in personalization, as one of your slides were saying, um, we are a small travel agency, and we're trying to do the same. So we recently bought a um, marketing cloud from Salesforce. Oh, so you're my, not small, that's expensive. Yeah, we try, we try. So my question is, if you have worked with this tool or with any other tool, what would you recommend for marketers starting to use these kind of tools to personalize the marketing campaigns? And my second question is about, you were talking about celebrities, and in this case, uh, with the box, with influencers. So when it comes to influencer marketing, what would you recommend that we do to measure the ROI of the campaigns? Because sometimes it can get, you know, how many likes uh, reach, and we wanna know, like, specifically, the metrics that companies sure. like yours are, are using. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I'll answer, so from a, I'll talk broadly first about marketing tech because I was talking a little bit with Anthony about this. When I think about the CMO of tomorrow, there really is that balance between qualitative skills that you build in terms of storytelling, the quantitative skills that you get from basic math and being able to personalize better and understand you know, how, do I, how do I optimize my budget, especially in a world of programmatic buying where everything is now going to be done by AI. Um, and then the world of marketing tech because when you have digital platforms, a lot of that is based on technology. If you go what, five, 10 years ago, 500 marketing tech options, now there's 7,000 to choose from. What I always believe when it comes to marketing tech, it's like, if I can have a Ferrari driver with a Kia car, forgive me if you drive either, or a Kia driver, did I do this right, with a Ferrari car, which one would you rather have? Right? Kia, the Kia, if, uh, Kia driver, Ferrari car, Ferrari driver, Kia car, right? So a better tool when somebody doesn't necessarily know how to use it. My experience with that is when you have the Kia driver with the Ferrari car, the Ferrari car gets left in the garage because you don't know how to use it to its fullest extent. That is my same belief with marketing tech. Most of the time you're probably using 20% of the full range of that tool. So it really comes down to yes, having the right tool, but really fully leveraging its capability. When I think about CRM um, as it relates to tools, I've used SaaS, I've used Adobe, I've used Salesforce. It first really starts with having the right data because it'll be garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have that right data, you can't do that customization. And then really starting small and then just seeing that results very quick with a very clear A-B testing and closing the loop. Uh, when we were doing our marketing monthly campaign, casinos were very known for having very complicated reinvestment matrices. When we were actually putting it into the SaaS platform, it actually took 1,000 nodes to actually replicate the kind of logic that we had to the point it actually crashed SaaS. So start simple, A-B test, close the loop, keep on expanding, but make sure that the data is there and make sure that the, the loop is closed. Um, usually what happens is it's not the data that holds you back, it's actually having enough creative versions to actually have enough customization. Because once you have the data and you have the, and the analytics, you can create as many segments as you want. Where it will fall down is like, do I have enough creative to actually go against each of those segments? Data and segmentation, you know, and having different rules, very easy to scale. Having a thousand versions of creative, if you like make, if you like mascara versus you like lipstick or you like cleanser versus you like moisturizer, um, that much harder to scale. It's getting there, but that's much harder. Um, in terms of ROI, and I'll answer this broadly, 
um, I would I would used to talk with our CFO and I would say I did a marketing attribution and I said what well, this is um, you know correlation not causation as you would say when you're trying to do attribution and it's like well that's convenient I said no that's a curse right the marketer is always um, in that difficult position of being able to prove attribution for things that are top of funnel um, in lives when I had money lives when I didn't have money you know, we spent at least 200,000 doing this very complicated multi-touch attribution model, um, starter, player, closer, being able to get view through analytics from Facebook, comes in, it even had a market mix model in the beginning so that you can actually have base level demand before you even put the digital marketing on top of it, and nice pretty model at the end. The question is, after you get that, will you actually change your actions based on, the optimi based on what the model said? And because it was black box, as most algorithms will be, sometimes it's very hard to the marketer to believe, I can understand this, so I'm gonna change my action. I don't understand this black box. I don't know if I trust it to actually change how I'm allocating. So the question is, is, is will you, when you, whatever attribution model you're gonna use, will you actually trust it enough to actually take that corrective action? When I think about um, things that are as hard as influencer or even top of funnel advertising, we really would do market tests um, so first we would say, hey, this region only has this versus another region, so I can actually test lift between regions or time periods, but that's a little bit harder. But in other cases, especially with top of funnel, you do have to have conviction because you're not really gonna be able to see that empirically and you're gonna have to know that in the marketing mix, it is working. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I think that's it. Oh, one more. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I wanted to know kind of like tapping back on that influencer question, is that given that everybody talks about influencer marketing, how it's awesome and all of that, um, I know that your brand, BoxyCharm, kind of like relies on influencers and their you know, power in social media a lot. So what are kind of like the key things that you look for when you're planning like an influencer campaign? Uh, is it the reach of the influencers? Because I've, I mean, I follow a lot of beauty um, Instagrammers and I know that Big or small, they a lot of them use uh, boxy charms. So I wanted to know what you know, kind of like what are the key things that you look for? Sure. I think one thing that we do different is that we actually don't inf outsource our influencer marketing. So a lot of people would use agencies and rely on their relationships. We actually manage all of it in house. So we have personal relationships directly with the influencer. So for example, my head of influencer marketing the other day, I said we need to be able to do X, whatever X was she's texting that influencer that has four million followers directly on her phone. Not going through the aggregator agency, not going through the talent management agency, but direct personal relationships. So we actually have programs that we do specifically not because we're trying, yes, we might get content from it, but we're actually doing those programs because we're trying to create personal relationships with the influencers. Because that becomes the core foundation and somewhat of a competitive advantage. On the other piece, when we're trying to, do, to create content, we're very clear, here's when we're creating content that we're preceding a brand or preceding the box, and here's what we would like from you, and here's what we're going to boost. And there are other times where we say, no, we just wanna be of culture and associate our brand with that influencer in a more organic way. Um, because at the end of the day, the consumer can tell um, if something is organic and authentic versus not. Um, and so at the end of the day, you can't, fool them, they're that smart. So really trying to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing really does come across as authentic um, you know, when it comes from an influencer or when we're trying to orchestrate something where the influencer does it organically. Good, well thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>